All right. Hello, class, and welcome to part C of lecture 10, which brings together so many of the concepts that we've talking we've been talking about for what is really the piece de resistance of the of the course, which is an LMI which solves essentially the optimal control problem for linear systems. Um, we've solved lots of pieces of it, but we haven't solved the actual problem yet, which is dynamic output feedback, right? optimal H infinity output feedback control. So this is the LMI, that's the, that's the result. Uh, so I could just state it and be done with it. But uh, considering its significance and the fact actually that there are that I'm aware of, there aren't any other proofs that I can find. There are at least that not that are easily accessible or do it quite this way, or very informative. So we'll go through all the put all the pieces together and and prove it. And it's really the hardest proof in this course. Um, it takes the longest time. So, but we're going to go through it, and hopefully, I'll present it in a way which makes sense. Hopefully. Won't guarantee it. So let's start with the statement of the theorem. Uh, so the theorem says that a necessary and sufficient condition for the existence of a feedback controller, right, a full state uh, dynamic controller, which includes loop, satisfies the H infinity norm gamma. Closed loop, right? This is the nine matrix representation. Using that controller is equivalent, right, to the existence of variables. These are the variables. X1, Y1, AN, CN, BN, DN. Those are the variables. Such that this is positive definite and such that this big term here is negative definite. And you see that the variables appear linearly in the LMI, which is somewhat, somewhat of a miracle, considering how many variables we have and how many substitutions we've gone through. And so we can solve it. You can plug it into YAMIP and you can solve it. And it actually works better, more reliably, I would say, than most of the MATLAB functions we, we, we often use. Now, the variables are not the controller. There's two variable transformations that need to occur before you get your controller. So this is, as stated, an existence result, right? this LMI is satisfied, if and only if there exists a controller. Okay. But the, the, the theorem goes a little bit further and says, not only does there exist one, but this is what it is. Or actually, it's not exactly what the, it is, because you have some flexibility, actually. So what is it? So given A, N, B, N, C, N, D, N, X1, and Y1, what is the controller that achieves that H infinity norm gain? We have a, after you've solved the LMI, you have a little bit of extra work to do. Uh, specifically, it says the controller is given by uh, these uh, variable transformations, which we already went through in part A, uh, on DK2. Well, what's DK2? So DK, AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2, and here actually is not state-space representation, it's just the matrix. Um, is given by the variables. These are the variables you found by solving the LMI. Minus uh, this term here. So you subtract off uh, this term, which is bilinear, but that's okay. It it's it's a posteriori, it's fine. Multiplied by 
on the left and the right, uh, the inverse of these, this matrix here, where x2, which is not a variable which appears, x2 is any matrix completion of x such that x equals y inverse. Well, and we know how to find that from the variable converse transformation level, and I'll summarize it at the end. So this exists from, uh, I believe, the converse transformation level. Uh, no, this is the... Um, Uh, no, this is the, uh, the original transformation. Transformation lemma. Uh, and we'll, we'll give a formula for those. It's, it's not hard to find. But you, have, you do actually have some flexibility in x2 and y2. So given a solution, a and b and c and dn, x1, y1, find x2 and y2, and then your ak2, bk2, ck2, and dk2 are given by this. This yields AK2, BK2, CK2, DK2. Which then, through this variable transformation, yields AK, BK, CK, DK. So not only does it give you a existence result, it tells you what controller will actually achieve this. And you have some flexibility because these are not uniquely defined here, as we talked about in the transformation lemma. Okay. So, okay, how are we going to approach this proof? Right. Well, we approach it in the obvious way. We start off by approaching it in the obvious way. Uh, we're gonna show that first two implies one. That if the LMI is satisfied, then uh, the controller satisfies this H infinity bound. So suppose that the LMI is feasible. There exists these variables such that this is satisfied. Now, first we uh, leverage the transformation lemma to show that there exists a completion of these matrices X and Y, such that X is the inverse of Y and y is the inverse of x. So we know what those are. Uh, we, we actually gave a formula for finding them, but we're not gonna discuss that part. We know they exist now. So there exists a completion. And uh, furthermore, we know that this completion satisfies this property that uh, uh, y, y2 can have a full rank, and so the half dual variable here also has full rank. All right, so that's from the transformation. Level. So now let's propose a controller and show that it achieves the H infinity norm bound, which we desire. So specifically, we uh, let AK, BK, CK, and DK be given by, from AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2. where we don't know what AK2, BK2, and CK2 are yet, but that's the next slide. Can't fit everything on the same slide. So that comes from AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2. And where do these come from? Well, they come from, well, actually it was on the, the tail end of that theorem, but I'll just remind you what it was. It comes from AN, BN, CN, and DN, and also X1 and Y1. These are the bears, bars, which you found by solving the LMI. And uh, those, uh, that, those completions, those show up right there. So we define our AK2, BK2, and DK2 in terms of AN, BN, CN, DN, and X1 and Y1. So from another previous slide uh, from lecture part A, uh, we know that, right, the closed loop, right, the uh, a linear fractional transformation of this controller, AK2, B, AK, BK, CK, DK, uh, with the nine matrix representation of P, has uh, this form ACL, BCL, CCL, DCL, 
It's a ma matrix. This is a system. This is the matrix. Where ACL, BCL, CCL, and DCL are affine in AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2. But of course, those aren't our variables. So we're going to just plug in this expression for those variables into this uh, representation. So that gets plugged in there. And we get a new expression for ACL, BCL, CCL, and DCL in terms of our variables A, N, B, N, C, N, and D, N, and also X1, Y1, and this matrix completion Y2. So that's our closed loop system. So now, um, what we'd like to do is show that this closed loop system has H infinity norm less than gamma. And how do we do that? Well, of course, we apply the Schur complement lemma. So specifically, the closed loop system, that's ACL, BCL, CCL, DCL, right? By the uh, the, Schur, uh, the 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 KYP lemma, sorry, it has an H infinity norm less than gamma, if and only if this matrix here in the middle is satisfied, right? This is the full the dilated primal KYP lemma from lecture nine. Now, so if this matrix is negative, definite, then the H infinity norm is less than gamma. Now we know from uh, properties of positive matrices that this is equivalent, if YCL is full rank, to uh, the, uh, to the, the product where you multiply YCL II, this half dual transformation, transformation on the left and the right. right. So is it negative? Is this thing negative? That's the question. And so the remainder of these slides, uh, and there are several of them because uh, they're large matrices, is nothing more than showing that this thing which we want to be negative is equal to the matrix which we um, assumed is negative because, right, that's what we're trying, that's, that's two, right? This is from two. So we know that this is negative from two. And we want to show that these two, are, may, these two things are equal. This is the important part. So how do we show that? That's, that's, that's a challenge. It's, uh, it's, it's just algebra, it's not terribly difficult. Uh, but in order to you know, show it on reasonable number of slides and without getting too confused, we'll try and simplify it uh, a little bit. Right. So first of all, right, we take this matrix, which we're trying to show to be negative, trying to show that's negative. And first, our, our first step, and we actually had it on the notes slide earlier, uh, we show that this is equal to this. Where we, where we get rid of the primal variable and we re replace it with the half primal variable. So this goes to that. So we have a half primal variable, half primal variable, half primal variable, half primal variable. And then we have the half dual variable, half dual variable, half dual variable, uh, and half dual variable. Right. So we've already shown this. This is already shown that, this equality. So this is what we're trying to prove is negative. Right? And so essentially what we're trying to show is that this equals that matrix on the previous slide, this thing, big thing right here. And so how are we gonna do that? Well, basically, we break it up into chunks. Okay. So let's just break it up a little bit. There's a chunk. There's a 
chunk, sorry. And there's a chunk, sorry. And there's a chunk. Yeah. So in particular, uh, comparing terms on the previous slide, we want to show that that bit right there, right, is DCL. Uh, sorry, not, yeah, that's DCL. That doesn't have any variables in it. Right? This bit is uh, this bit, CCL, YCL. This bit is uh, XCL, BCL, I believe. Just looking at, oh, the, the transpose, sorry. So it's, uh, it's actually this bit. So that bit transposed. And then of course, this uh, two by two matrix up here, that is uh, YCL transpose ACL XCL plus the transpose of that. That's, what's, uh, that's what we're trying to show. That's about that. So just by comparing the matrices, what we're trying to show then, right, is that that bit right there, half of the one one block, is equal to that block. This block is equal to that block. This block is equal to that block. And this block is equal to this block. So I can color code those a bit. Those two are equal. Uh, these two are equal, change color. This equals that. And finally, third color, which we choose. Um, got it, got orange. Uh, okay. Pink. So we have to show those four equalities, right? And then, right, that, that just comes from uh, this uh, matrix, which I've very, ah, sorry. Make sure he's adding the right color. Yes, that's right color. So, so that's actually pink. Sorry, sorry. Um, let me if I delete those things. So that one's pink, pink. Uh, what, what colors? Blue. Um, yellow. Okay, that, I, I don't need to do all the colors, maybe. But I will, because I'm pedantic that way. So just by looking at those matrices, right, we can see that that's what we're trying to show. So the, the goal then, right, is to show this, that that equals that. So obviously, uh, we have to examine this term here. So let's examine that term here and show it is what we want it to be. So let's look at that. All right, so uh, first of all, let's plug in for ACL, BCL, YCL, and DCL. So from the affine representation we had on the previous slide, right, that's, it's this thing right here. Right. So affine in AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2. Why aren't we using A and B and C and Indian? Well, we will, uh, but at this point we don't need to. It actually works better if we don't do it quite yet. Uh, so we've got, uh, we can break this into two terms, right? This term and this term, and just because these are big matrices, let's handle them separately. So remember, we have uh, expressions for YCL and XCL. Let's like plug those into the, the next slide. So let's look at the first term first. That's the first term. All right, so uh, let's expand our expression for YCL and XCL. So that was our expression for YCL. This is our expression for XCL. 
And, uh, you know, this is just matrix multiplication. So let's do the matrix multiplication. We multiply through by both matrices. And we get this expression here. And so we can color code that as well, if we like. Uh, so that's, this is the part which gets mapped to D1, or D, C, D, D. This is the part get, that gets mapped to C. Uh, and then we have the other two colors. Really made me have more, more colors on my screen here. Um, And uh, right away, we can look at, compare those to what we want, and we can see that uh, some of the pieces are already falling into place. So those, those terms uh, correspond to that, uh, correspond to that. Um, what else do we have? Correspond to that. Uh, I believe uh, the, the terms that have that N in them are the ones that are showing up here. That, that, that and uh, that. So those terms have already appeared. Uh, notice we have one extra term here, however, uh, this term. Uh, so we have an extra term, and hopefully that'll disappear when we get the, the second part of this expression. So let's examine the, the second part of this expression. So this is the second term. Remember what we're trying to show here, of course. Uh, we're trying to show that, right, we're examining this piece, this, that's what we're working with, and we're trying to show that it's equal to this. Right? And so we've shown already that the first part of this expression is these terms here. Now we have to show that the second part of the expression is the remaining terms that we haven't covered yet. So let's examine those uh, remaining parts. Uh, so this is the second part of that expression. Um, so this one's a little bit more complicated and there's like a, a, a bit of a trick involved, right? So again, we expand out our expression for XCL and we expand out our expression for YCL. There's YCL, there's XCL. And first step, we multiply it by this matrix here to, so this term here becomes this term and this term here becomes this term, right? So we've simplified. Unfortunately, of course, we have it in AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2. And so that's annoying um, because we need it in terms of A and B and C and DN, which is, right, that's what we're trying to show here. Um, if you remember our expression for, a, uh, uh, for AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2, in terms of A and B and C and in DN, however, remember it has these inverses on the left and the right. So we're going to get rid of those inverses. Um, go further, right? By factoring these two matrices out, so essentially passing those variables through those matrices, so pulling out the parts which don't depend on the variables out of those. So we use this identity that this term is equal to this term, the, the product of those two terms, so we factored out that that term and these, this term is equal to the product of these two terms. So again, we've factored these X and Y through that matrix here um, to get, uh, so notice that these are the same matrices on both, we, we've moved this thing through. Uh, and again, here we've moved uh, the thing through, right? The actually the identity has changed spots, so it's not exactly the same thing. But we've been able to move our, our, our dual, half dual variables through this matrix. And we'd be able to move our half primal variables also through this matrix, right? And that's, that's important, right? Because now they're right next to the variables that we care about, the decision variables. And so that's good. That allows us to do our variable substitution, right? So specifically, um, our variable substitution, the A and B and C and substitution, is to take this whole term here and make that our new variable, right? Make that our an, bn, cn, dn. Well, it's not quite that simple because of course we had this extra term here, remember? Uh, this extra term here. So we need it to be actually, we're gonna move this extra term inside 
uh, this expression here. We're going to move that extra term inside here and make that our new variables plus extra term. So when we move it inside the variables, it, uh, it comes out, uh, fortunately, just uh, right here. And so we make this whole thing uh, the, our new variable, our variable substitution, a and b and c and dn, plus uh, the other bit over here that we want to get rid of. So we have a new, new set of variables, a and b and c and dn, uh, which now our closed loop, uh, our, our, our KYP lemma is now affine in those, in those variables. So uh, we, 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 we show that, right? We, we um, finalize this step now, right? Uh, right, by saying AK2, BK2, CK2, DK2, of course, is, the, uh, is that inverse, right? We just move these things from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, right? They were, were on the left-hand side when we defined the variables. Now we're moving to the right-hand side. Um, and so when we plug these these variables in, right, these uh, these inverses cancel each other out, right? And I guess that's actually obvious from the previous slide. So this whole expression, right, uh, inside becomes right, a n, b n, c n, and d n, um, minus that little bit, that extra part, which we then when we combine these all these terms together. Right, so we remember this is uh, well, um, yeah. Uh, this is this is just the second part, right? So I can't say that's just ACL, BCL, CCL, and BCL. Right. So I'll just anyway. So we have this uh, so the, this second part, right? And so we conclude right by taking this showing that the whole expression uh, is affine in our variables, and then plus the extra part right there. And so we multiply that all out, and we get uh, this expression, right, which are the remaining terms in the expression we wanted to prove in the first place. And I forgot my color coding. Uh, I think pink, what was pink? Um, well, this was this was or yellow. I think C was pink. I'm not actually sure. And uh, then we had orange for for B. So if we uh, we look at that um, that expression right now, we've got uh, the whole expression here. Right. We have the first part plus the second part. The first part was this one. The second part was this one. We add them to the two together, these extra terms cancel out, and we get right, an expression here, uh, which is what we were trying to prove. So we've proven that this term equals that term. So, and again, I guess I can color code these if we like. Although we've already given this expression, so probably not necessary. So thus, right, we've shown that this expression, right, where we apply the half dual transformation to the closed loop system KYP lemma, right, uh, is equal to our LMI. Right? And since our LMI is, ne is negative definite, by assumption, this is two, uh, we have that, uh, this term here is negative definite. And by the KYP lemma, because Y is CL is full rank, this implies that the closed loop system satisfies the H infinity norm less than gamma, right? which is what we were trying to show. So sufficiency, the LMI is sufficient for this controller to uh, establish an H infinity norm bound of less than gamma. Uh, the other direction is, uh, again, it's just it, it, be, that equality uh, relationship is, is the core of it. So it's just really bookkeeping at this point. But let's go through it. Uh, so 
necessity. One implies two. So suppose there exists um, a AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2 such that the closed loop system has norm less than gamma. There exists. By the KYP lemma, this implies the existence of an X greater than zero such that the dilated primal KYP lemma is satisfied. Dilated primal KYP lemma. Overuse our acronyms there. Satisfied. Uh, so we know that there exists an X. Great. And we know AK2, BK2, CK2, DK2 exists. Now we've got to get, remember, we have to get X1, Y1, AN, BN, CN, and DN. All right. So we have AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK, and two many of X, and we have to get these other things. Well, we know what X1 is, right? It's just the 1, 1 block of X, so that's it. Uh, now define the inverse of X. We know it's invertible because it's positive definite. And obviously, Y1 will be the inverse of uh, the 1, 1 block, or the 1, 1 block of the inverse. Um, so, right, we, uh, we have this, this completion. And by the converse transformation lemma, right, we know that the, this LMI, the first part of the LMI is satisfied. Okay. Furthermore, we know that YCL also has full, row rank, or full rank, um, and uh, in X2, uh, we can assume has full row rank because the uh, inequalities here are strict, right? Because X, uh, X1, X2, X2 transpose, X3 is strictly positive zero, uh, greater than zero. Uh, that means that it's greater than epsilon I. And so we can add, uh, we could just add an, an, a, ver a sufficiently small uh, uh, identity identity here to this for for delta sufficiently small and the positivity will will still be retained right. so we can uh, we can assume that x2 also has full row rank and so by the converse transformation lemma uh, ycl has full row rank and the uh, the inequality is satisfied so the first part of the lmi is satisfied for those choices of x1 y1 so we have that now we have to turn our attention to the second part of the LMI. We have to show that this is negative. Uh, for this, we have to define our variables a and b and c and d n. But of course, uh, we, uh, we, we, we know pretty much what we're doing at this point. Obviously, uh, we have a, k, p, u, b, g, two, a, we have a, k, b, k, c, k, d, k. Uh, we define our, these, dummy, these new variables a, k, b, k, 2, c, k, 2, and d, k, 2 in the way we defined earlier. Uh, then, right, the closed loop system has the desired affine form. And uh, now we define A and B and C and DN in terms of those AK2, BK2, DK2, and CK2. So we're going from DK, from the Ks to the K2s, and from the K2s to the Ns. Right. And, of course, uh, the X2 gets mixed in there, the X1 as well. But we now have all six variables, X1, uh, Y1, an, bn, cn, and dn. Uh, furthermore, right, from the equality, that was the important part that we showed, we have that uh, the closed loop system, right, this closed loop system matrix uh, inequality, well, we know that's negative definite, right? And so if we multiply it on the left and the right by YCL, that's also negative definite. And uh, just uh, as before, we, we know that, that this equation equals this equation. And as before, we have already shown, right, that uh, this expression, this matrix, equals this matrix. And so we have that since uh, the desired LMI is equal to this thing, is equal to this thing, which is uh, negative definite by the KYP lemma, we have that the LMI is satisfied. for those choices of variables. And that concludes uh, the proof. We've shown both directions. So to summarize, right, uh, just the takeaway from this, uh, this lecture, right, 
Uh, we have an optimization problem where we're minimizing gamma. Again, gamma is affine in this expression. Uh, such uh, with the, the other variables, this other six variables we talked about, such that this LMI is satisfied and this LMI is satisfied. Note we don't need to constrain independently x1 to, or y1 to be positive. We don't need those because this one does that for us. Yeah. So you can plug this into YOLMIP if you like, and uh, that'll give you your AND, BNC, and DN, and then you can use the substitutions we we talked about to recover AK2, AK, BK, CK, and DK. In particular, uh, how does that substitution work, right? Given A and B and C and DN and X1, Y1, how do we define our AK, BK, CK, and DK? Uh, well, first of all, right, we had to, um, we had to construct Y2 and, and X2, remember, from the, from the, from the theorem. But if you remember the, uh, the, the proof of the variable uh, of the transformation lemma, uh, all we needed for y2 and x2 to be a completion of those matrices is that x2 and y2 have to satisfy this equation. Right? So we know what this is, known. And x2 and y2 are any choice such that this is true. So we have significant flexibility here in the variables in our con sort of controller parameterization, x2 and y2. Uh, but the easiest way to do this is to either let y2 be identity or let x2 be the identity. And if, uh, of course, if y x2 is the identity, then y2 transpose is just equal to this, which is, uh, so that, that's just, so y2 is the transpose. So one shows is x2 equals identity y2 equals i minus x1, y1 transpose. And the other choice is to let y2 be identity, and then x2 is just i minus x1, y1. All right. So we have to pick a matrix completion, but we have flexibility. In fact, you can multiply this through by any, uh, any uh, invertible matrix, and you get another equivalent controller. What this means, of course, is that uh, you need, the controller is not uniquely defined. But we'll, let, let's come back to that in a second. So we, we now have A and B and C and D and We have X1 and Y1. And now we also have X2 and Y2. So we may now invert our variable substitution to recover AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2, where these things are guaranteed to, to be invertible because of the rank constraint. And then we uh, use that AK2, BK2, CK2 to find AK, BK, CK, DK, doing the substitution in this order. One, two, three, four. Easy to code into MATLAB, if you like. Uh, one final comment, of course, is, uh, as I said, the, this means the controller is uniquely defined. Any uh, suitable choice of X2 and Y2 works. Does that confuse us? Uh, remember that uh, optimization, the solution to an optimization problem may not be unique. Um, and in fact, remember, what we're looking for is a system, K, which uh, is represented by AK, BK, CK, and DK. So why is that not unique? Well, if you remember your state space theory a little bit, right? Uh, if you have a, a four matrix representation of a system, right, that gives us a particular choice of, of X. Like X now has a physical meaning through that choice of AK, BK, CK, and DK. Actually, the input to that is Y, I should say that. And the output is U. So a given choice of our controller fixes the value of the internal state x. But remember, we don't care about the internal state x. We only care about the input-output relationship of the controller. So in fact, any um, similarity transform on the uh, state of the system, right? any other x hat equals tx, also defines a state space system. Right? So I believe it's. Uh, T, A, T inverse also works. And then, uh, what is it? Uh, 
T B um, C T inverse uh, D K right those are K's there right that's also also uh, a controller which is to use the same input output mount so also optimal Now the question is, is there a particular state space representation that is better than another for a controller? Well, we haven't defined a metric on the state space representation, which is uh, of any value to the optimal control problem. So for that purpose, no, but I suppose this could be a discussion problem or something. Um, finally, remember we need well-posedness. So in the end, uh, we have no way of guaranteeing this at this point. So we just have to check the rank of I minus D22 DK for a given DK and check whether it's invertible, right? And if it is, good, we're optimal. If it's not, uh, well, maybe there's a, uh, there's a problem with your system and it's just not controllable in the sense. So, oh well. Nothing you can really do other than redefine the, the nine matrix representation or the plant. So finally, uh, what we have uh, is a transfer function or a system uh, which represents that controller and which achieves the gain uh, the, a gamma from inputs to outputs, regulated uh, exogenous inputs to regulated outputs in the L2 sense, finite gain. Okay. And it, that, that bound is minimized. So we conclude uh, with uh, a statement, which we don't prove in any way, uh, that there are actually other uh, people represent these LMIs differently sometimes, which I don't like it, uh, but I'll just mention that it exists. Uh, in particular, I think Dullard and Paganini gives this one. Uh, you can represent these LMIs differently, uh, separating out the observable and controllable variables in this way by constructing null space matrix representations of these two things right here. So N0 and C0 and C are representations of the null space of those matrices. Uh, I don't know how you do that. I mean, it, there's probably a MATLAB function for it or something. Anyway, you construct those things and uh, then the LMI uh, boils down to this LMI right here, and this LMI right here. Right. Uh, so again, I don't like using these things, but right there. And also, right, uh, this doesn't, I, I don't like this representation because it doesn't actually give you the controller. I mean, there's a, I guess there's a way to construct it, but it's not obvious. So the, the LMI is not terribly constructive, so I'm not a big fan. Um, but just to know uh, that the, this, this appears occasionally in the literature. All right, so uh, to conclude this lecture, uh, which uh, the second part's gone on far rather long, uh, we've now really achieved the, 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 the first big result of the class. And the rest are sort of, uh, you know, addendums, I suppose. Uh, you can even think of robust controls in addendum, although you probably won't look that way. Um, lecture 11 is definitely an addendum where we'll consider the, uh, the H2 optimal control problem. Uh, but really, uh, we've achieved uh, a, a significant result uh, where we know how to construct optimal controllers, at least in the H infinity sense. And so we will, at this point, rest on our laurels and come back in the next lecture to that H2 case and try and do our best to interpret it in some way, uh, give an LQR interpretation, give a noise interpretation, but um, that will have to wait till the next lecture.